Hey, Magic Lantern listeners, there is no opening scene today because this is a special episode, our annual review of our favorite discoveries of the year. So what say you? Are you ready to ring out 2020? Good Lord, I'm ready to kick its butt out the door. I don't know about you, but this title for our episode seems very apropos. I sure had ants in my pants the entirety of 2020. How about you? I did, but I went to the doctor. You didn't. (laughs) Are you ready to get on with this? I am. Okay, let's go. Welcome to the Magic Lantern Podcast, an ongoing informal discussion of the films we love and the things we love about them. I am Erica Long. And I am Cole Rolaine, and this is a special episode this time around. We are at episode 148 today, and this is the 2020 installment of our traditional Ants in Your Pants Spectacular. It's our year-end celebration of the films that were our favorite discoveries, our favorite first-time watches. As usual, we each came up with a list of our top 10, and I've gone with chronological order of release again this year, oldest to newest. How about you? Same for me. I'm covering the 40s through the 2010s in my instance. Well, would you like to kick us off here? I would, with a doozy as usual. That is The Monster and the Girl from 1941, directed by Stuart Heisler with Ellen Drew, Robert Page, Paul Lucas, and then about a trillion Lantern favorites. Joseph Kalea, Mark Lawrence, George Zuko. The list just goes on and on. It is about, get this, a young woman who is coerced into prostitution and her brother is framed for murder by this organized crime syndicate. But retribution is coming to them in the form of an ape. Yes, You heard it here, an ape. So this movie is absolutely bananas, pun intended. (laughs) (laughs) As I mentioned, every amazing character actor has a part in this. I still can't fathom how the gorilla comes into this human trafficking noir sci-fi story. It's also a gorilla and a dog buddy movie. Really, it was the greatest day of my life, basically. Yeah, this is from the Gorilla Gonna Kill You Universal Horror Collection Volume 5. And I've been trying to see this movie for a long, long time. And finally, it appeared in this collection. It was really the highlight of the collection, I think. The others being mostly terribly racist. Yeah, that's true. I mean, you know that's one of my favorite subgenres. That's why you got the box set for us. This movie did not disappoint. I think really because they were making an A picture here just with a B or D movie title. Because it's incredibly well shot and directed, too. So a home run for me. Well, I'm going to go back a few years and start mine all the way back in 1928. And that is with The Wind. And that is directed by Victor Sjostrom. And it stars Lillian Gish, Lars Hansen, and Montague Love. It's one of the very last silent films released by MGM. And it is considered a high water mark of the silent era. One of the great all-time silents. Yeah. And within minutes, it's really easy to see why. It's about a retiring young girl from Virginia that moves west, ending up in Texas, where she is slowly driven mad by the harsh landscape and the howling, battering, relentless wind. The Erica Long story. I was going to say, I can relate to this. There are so very few films that I've ever seen that so fully capture the power of the elements like this one does. It was something that Seostrom was particularly good at, actually. Landscape and nature and their metaphorical connection to his character's interior states. That's a bit of a signature for him. And this especially applies to situations where the overwhelming grandeur or particular intensity of the conditions like this wind are foregrounded in the story. I think this one holds a special appeal to we Okies that were weaned on these inescapable images of the Dust Bowl and what our families went through during that time. I felt like I was getting windblown dirt out of the creases of my skin for days after I watched this. And how is Lillian Gish? She's incredible, as usual. She's the other force of nature in the film, I would say. She's operating equally impressively on two levels. She's doing an incredible job mentally unraveling in that way that silent films sometimes play to the back row. 
But then she's also simultaneously doing these subtle little things that the camera barely catches. It also rises above the conventions of more lazy silent melodramas by very specifically giving all the antagonists rounded and believable motivations and reactions. It's not just mustache twirling types. But what it really comes down to is that titular wind. It is so impressively relentless that you can hear these silent images. You imagine it so vividly that it makes its own sound in your mind. You feel it in the way that Gish perceives and fights against it. You feel it in the way that it threatens to wear down everything until nothing remains. And you feel it in your bones. One of the most elementally and psychologically atmospheric things I've ever seen. Would you say a really good gateway for folks who may be wary of watching silent films? I think so. It's got enough of those conventions, but it's so late in the period that you feel it edging toward more contemporary storytelling styles. It does all of them equally well, so I would say definitely, especially it being one of the best of the form ever made. Okay, what do you have next? I've got a super fun comedy, and that is Holy Matrimony from 1943, directed by John Stahl with my favorite Monty Woolley, Gracie Fields, and Laird Kriegar. It's based on a novel called Buried Alive, though that doesn't really give you an idea of what the film is like. It's about an artist who returns from years abroad, and he takes the identity of his dead valet in order to escape the attentions of the press and fame. I was so close to putting this on my list, too. I really loved it. It was probably, say, 13th or 14th, so it didn't quite make the top 10 cut, but it was in the running for sure. I'm not sure how we came across this initially. Maybe we were on a Monty Woolley kick. But what a find. It is just utterly charming and gentle and smart at the same time. And Gracie Fields, who was a new one for me, she really shines in this wonderful role that really captured all of her gifts. Uh, I think it's pronounced gifs. <laughs> topical. If you're a fan of the man who came to dinner like I am, it might be hard to think of Monty Woolley portraying a person who has a real human relationship, but Gracie Fields is so warm and this comes at just the right time in this character's life that it's incredibly believable. So everything that ensues, whether to reveal his true identity or not, what matters most in his life and preserving it, that all feels very real and important. What's next for you? The second item on my list is The Phantom of the Convent from 1934, and that's directed by Fernando de Fuentes and starring Enrique del Campo, Marta Roel, and Carlos Villatoro. It's an early Mexican horror film about a couple and their friend who get lost in a forest and are taken into a crumbling convent by a strange monk to pass the night. Sounds super promising so far. It would only have been more promising if it were 74 and there had been nude nuns. I feel a little bit of the influence of this on those things, actually, and I'll get to that in a second. Like my first choice, The Wind, this has atmosphere for miles in this one. It's in that tradition of old dark house movies that we love so much, but with a distinctly Mexican Catholic flavor. And that influence that I just mentioned in reference to what you said, you can feel it extending all the way to things like the Blind Dead series with its decrepit Knights Templar. There is something special about this one, though, compared to its contemporaries that ensured it a spot on this list. This has undercurrents of eroticism that you do not find on such overt display in other similar films from the time. In the U.S. or the U.K., you might find characters that are gathered for the reading of a will, their actions are motivated by greed or fear of a family secret being exposed. Any romance is typically very chaste and often motivated by the stress of being in these uncommon circumstances that these strangers have been thrown into together. It's usually some beefy young guy helping out a demure young girl. Even in The Old Dark House from 1932, where Melvin Douglas takes the girl off to the barn to get a little quiet time together, it's nothing really like this. In The Phantom of the Convent, the wife of the couple explicitly attempts to seduce her husband's friend, enticing him to commit adultery in what is basically a church. 
The Hays Code obviously didn't extend all the way to Mexico. And, as it turns out, a very similar situation played out with the monks who lived here many years ago on a night just like tonight. So it has all the things that we love about this style of horror film. Cobwebs and candlelight, coffins, corpses of the corrupt. You like that alliteration there? I do. And it adds to that mix a layer of explicit sauciness that was being phased out of American films at the time. And then on top of all of that, it has a more poetic sensibility than your average old dark house movie. It plays more like a dream than anything else. I really enjoyed this one. Well, speaking of sauciness, I've got a wonderful choice next. Zazie dans le Metro, which I can't believe it took me this long to see it. From 1960, directed by Louis Malle, with Catherine de Mangio, Philippe Noiret, and Carla Marlier. It's about our titular Zazie. Her mother is away for the weekend, so she goes to stay with her uncle in Paris. This sounds like a dream for little Erica. Absolutely. It is a daffy thrill ride. I can't imagine this ever ages or ever would not find an audience. We get to see so much of the crazy city, 1960 being a perfect year for this. And Zazie is just way too much fun. It reminds me quite a bit of Alice in the Cities, in the tradition of kids being totally adorable and fun, but with an edge. Yeah, I feel it occupying a space directly between the red balloon and that. It's kind of the exact midpoint. You want to hang out with all of those kids. My favorite line of hers in the whole thing, don't you dig my fatal charm? <laughs> That's what I was just about to say. This is a great script with all of this anarchic wordplay. And there's just so much visual fun from start to finish. I loved it. Thank you for finally putting it on for me. You are absolutely welcome. My number three choice isn't quite as fun, exactly. It is Try and Get Me! Exclamation point from 1950, also known as The Sound of Fury. And that's directed by Cy Enfield, and it stars Frank Lovejoy and Lloyd Bridges. This is actually the first one on my list that we watched together, even if you didn't choose it for your list. This one has been on my list of to watch or to buy, add to the collection, for years now. And I am so glad that I finally got around to it. It's about a down-on-his-luck everyman who falls under the sway of a small-time criminal whose desire to pull bigger and bigger jobs culminates in this botched kidnapping that ends in murder. To my mind, this is one of the best late classic period American noir films ever made. Of course, guess who panned it? Bosley Crowther. Yep. Ugh. Got it on the first try. Screw you, Bosley. It is doubly fascinating to me that this is based on a true story. Whoa. I love these rip from the headlines noir like this or a Phoenix City story. When they are well executed, it really adds an extra layer of intensity to the story and it makes the stakes feel that much higher. The peril definitely feels more dire when they do these right. And Lloyd Bridges, he feels like the biggest revelation here because his ability to channel that charm while barely keeping his more deranged tendencies under control, it's really something to behold. The thing that really struck me, speaking of the whole everyman quality, was that when you're inside Frank Lovejoy's tiny house, you can feel that you could touch every single wall at once. Everything is closing in on you. Yeah, eternally relatable for all of us who are living on that level where we're just trying to make ends meet, and sometimes they don't. The big advantage, though, I think that this one has is that it seizes fully upon the way that noir had been streamlined by this point in the cycle. It's leaner and especially meaner than a lot of its predecessors. It has a similar... Nothing could have happened to stop this convergence of ill-intention feeling that's probably best exemplified by In Cold Blood. I feel like it's a precursor to that. Same for me. And it's also an indictment on a much larger scale than its contemporaries because of the power of the scene where the mob comes for Lloyd Bridges, implying that there's just a horrible violence lurking in all of us and it's just waiting for a quote-unquote legitimate excuse to be unleashed. It is harrowing. Well, I'm about to get super dark from here on out, basically. My next choice was The Beast in the Cellar from 1971, directed by James Kelly, also written by James Kelly, with Beryl Reed, Flora Robeson, John Hamill, and Tessa Wyatt. Now, 
We're in a rural English town, and soldiers are being brutally murdered by some unknown creature. At the same time, we have two older sisters living nearby, and they might know what's happening. It was just wonderful to see the older actresses really get a chance to do their stuff and hold the focus of the story, especially Flora Robeson, who we talked about in Black Narcissus. And there are a ton of wonderful touches and real pathos in this film. I'm reminded of Flora Robeson putting on the soldier's outfit to essentially do her duty. It's very cool. I know we both really like this, and I think it was a great find. And again, it's a great film with a title that might make you think it's something else, but there's a lot of deeper emotion and irony going on here. Yeah, it definitely rises above that easy to fall back on pair of dotty spinsters that are lovable. They do a lot more than that. It has that on the surface. It lures you in with that. But these details, like you're pointing out, really set it apart from other things like it. I, I say that, but there's actually maybe nothing else really like it. Yeah, that's true. It's English gothic with some Kensington gore, but then Dickens in there as well. Well, let's go from England all the way to Japan for my next one. And my number four slot is The Mad Fox from 1962. And this is a Japanese film directed by Tomu Uchida and starring Hashizo Okawa, Michiko Saga, and Ryunosuke Tsukigata. It's about a court fortune teller who is framed for a crime and then driven from the palace, who is then taken in and protected by a fox in human form, whom, of course, he eventually falls in love with and marries. This is a fantastic merging of the best elements of theater and cinema and folk tale. It draws upon a number of traditional Japanese theater forms and techniques, and the fox is a significant figure in Japanese folklore. In Kyoto, for example, we went to the Fushimi Inari Shrine, and foxes figure prominently in the lore of that temple and in Japan in general. It's just beautiful to behold. I love this cultural embrace of the trickster spirit that's always fun. And the movie moves deeper and deeper into that as we go. And the way it's structured is fascinating, just in storytelling terms. The first act is, quote unquote, the real world, though it's all kind of stylized. It takes place in what is largely recognizable as the world we know in this realistic location of the palace. The second act, though, it takes place against an even more stylized, dreamlike backdrop, with characters and locations being specifically exaggerated, taking place on obvious sets. And then the third act moves even further inside, both psychologically and practically, taking place almost completely on a single stage set, like you're watching a filmed play. I think you could see yourself way back when in the town square having this performed for you, watching even a puppet show version of this, or even having a troubadour tell you the story, and it would always work. The way that unfolds, one into the next into the next, it gives this feeling of being drawn further and further into the story, going down an increasingly fancifully represented foxhole. And there is a final sequence of stagecraft that you just have to see to believe. I had to show you just that part because it was so jaw-dropping. It is astounding. The story itself is solid. It's very much something that you'd find in a collection of fables or fairy and folk tales, but the real reason for me to watch this is for the amazing way that it is visually presented. You won't have seen very much like it. Okay, what do you have here for us at the halfway point? I've got some diabolical fun for us. That is Don't Go to Sleep from 1982, directed by Richard Lang, with Dennis Weaver, Valerie Harper, Robin and Nico, Kristen Cumming, and Ruth Gordon. It's about a young girl who begins seeing the ghost of her sister who died in an accident a year earlier. I said this was diabolical. I should say the characters are the diabolical ones. This is a game of who is the absolute worst sibling slash homicidal maniac slash gaslighter, and no one is going to get out of this alive. This was the second of two TV movies we watched with Valerie Harper, and she gets put through the ringer in these movies. Dennis Weaver, I think, though, maybe gets the absolute worst death, or maybe the little brother does. They're creepy sequences, and the Dennis Weaver one has this 
sexual underbelly, which is very yicky. Ruth Gordon, though, I wish she had been the one behind it all. I wish she had murdered everybody. (laughs) Or if she had just killed all the kids, that would have been fine, too. It surprises me that this was made as late as 1982, because you and I, we grew up in this where these 1970 TV horror movies are just in our wheelhouse. I love these. And I don't think of them being as an 80s thing nearly as much. I think the real golden era of that was the mid 70s, say 74 to 77. But obviously they hadn't run out of gas by this time because this was excellent. What you got next for us? My halfway marker is Lemonade Joe from 1964, and that's directed by Oldrich Lipsky and starring Carol Fiala, Rudolph Dale Jr., Milos Kopecki, and Kaveta Fialova. It is a Czech musical parody of the American Western and capitalism and is about a good guy, white hat, soft drink peddling gunfighter that comes to Stetson City, Arizona to take on a bunch of whiskey swilling bad guys. This is another big entry on my list. I've been trying to see this for years. This is an iconic Czech film, the highest grossing film in what was then Czechoslovakia for the entire decade of the 60s. Does this fit within the Czech New Wave? In a way, certainly. It is not nearly as anarchic as some of those entries, but the one thing that I think it really embraces is this idea that there needs to be no gulf between high art and low art. I think it really fixes on that idea. And so it slots in very neatly with some of these other satires. It's just incredibly fun. And it's almost overstuffed with these skewered Western tropes. The hypocritically moral gunfighter, the sultry chanteuse that serenades the rowdy saloon goers. Her name is Tornado Lou, which is one of the all-time great names for this type of character. There are evangelists trying vainly to start a temperance movement. And the good guy's a singing cowboy as well. It has a manic energy that I think feels reminiscent of some of my more favorite sly satirical comedy of the American 60s. If you're a fan of Laugh-In or The Monkees and that type of gentle absurdity, you will find a whole lot to like here. It's also always really interesting to me to see how non-American artists process and then give back to us these art forms and genres that are so distinctly American. There's always a lot to learn about how we are perceived by the global culture at large. And then you figure in that they are parodying the form out of what seems like a sincere affection for it and lampooning their own inclinations to embrace this American influence. There's a lot going on here, basically. And then you top that off with this distinctive and arresting color scheme and shooting style that almost feels like the undercranking of silent films. And what you end up with is a world cinema landmark that incorporates 50 years of movie making style and substance. Okay, what do you have for number six? I picked something that I ended up liking a lot more than you. It really knocked me for a loop in a good way, I think. And that was The Caller from 1987, directed by Arthur Allen Seidelman with Madeline Smith and Malcolm McDowell. One night... A woman living in the woods is approached at her door by an odd stranger whose car is broken down. He needs to use her phone. It becomes clear, though, that something else is happening. There's something unnatural in their interaction. There's some sort of mind game going on. This ended up being, for me, a great, weird, interesting two-hander. Madeline Smith, to me, is incredibly underrated in general, and It pays to examine everything she's wearing and what she does and to wonder why and then go back over those choices when you get to the end, which you don't see coming. I'm not going to say a lot about that because I do really hope that everybody gets a chance to see it and just let it unfold. I love these intense two-handers like Death and the Maiden or Closet Land. It makes me want to know more about how something like this is made How much time does it take? What was the experience of the two actors together when you're interacting so closely for a limited period of time in such an intense way? Well, when you're doing it with Malcolm McDowell, I assume it's probably pretty fun, actually. And you're right, I think this one struck you in a way that it didn't hit me, but I'm still glad to have it. This was one of those that Vinegar Syndrome has released this year that's a product of them getting access to more major studios' lesser efforts. So hopefully with our new subscription coming this year, we will get a lot more stuff like this. 
because we've had fun with those titles this year, haven't we? Yeah, absolutely. And I can't wait for you to see what's coming. I don't think you've seen the release slate yet, but... No, I haven't. It's going to be a lot of fun. Okay, great. Well, for my number six, yet again, another film that I've been trying to see for a long time. This has been a good year for catching up with a lot of those. I have chosen The Arch from 1968. And that's a film from Hong Kong written and directed by Tang Shu Xuan and starring Lisa Liu, Roy Chiao, and Hilda Chow Xuan. It's an 18th century period piece in which a respected widow falls in love with a visiting cavalry captain, but chooses to suppress her feelings when she realizes her daughter is also infatuated with him. It's notable for a number of reasons, not the least of which is that Cecile Tang was one of the few women directing films in Hong Kong at the time, and it's also somewhat surprisingly edited by Lantern favorite Les Blank. This fits nicely in that tradition of repressed desires that you often see in your English drawing room dramas. If it were 20 years later and shot in the UK, you might have something that slots neatly into the Merchant Ivory catalog, if that helps zero in on the vibe in your mind. But it's also distinctly Hong Kong, obviously, in a couple of important ways. And the first one of those is the way that Tang navigates the physical spaces that these women occupy in this 18th century village. The way this is shot, it's often windows within rooms, within doorways, so much compartmentalization indicated by the very specific dwellings and architecture that you would find then. It made me think a little of the way that similar architectural features tried to hem in Michelle Simone in Boodoo Save from Drowning. The second way that it grounds itself in the culture, it's just as restrictive, I think, but not so physically symbolic. It's the way that Lisa Liu is bound by the social mores of 18th century Hong Kong. Her longing is played with such remarkable restraint, yet somehow that does not discount how palpable a feeling it is. There's not enough time here for me to talk about the pedigree of the cast and the crew, the effects they would all have on the industry, the independent nature of this production and how important that was, the avant-garde way the score uses traditional instrumentation in a non-traditional way. There's just a ton happening here. It's very important. This is a significant film that deserves to be watched and studied by more people, and I encourage everyone to see it however they can. Another landmark of world cinema, it sounds like. Well, I think I have one of those to an extent as well, because it's about to get dark in here with... I Saw the Devil from 2010, directed by Kim Ji-Woon, with Lee Byung-hoon and Choi min Sink. We follow a security agent who embarks on a quest of revenge when his fiancée is brutally murdered by the psychopathic serial killer running loose. And there is no restraint to be had in this movie at all. Holy shit, this is a <laughs> non-stop ride. It is so dark. The killer has no remorse whatsoever, will never stop unless stopped. He's even part of a larger circle of serial killers. And the cop is ready to go the distance. So this is incredibly intense and pretty punishing, but totally worth it. I love these types of stories when they are an explicit examination of this idea that no one is willing to go as far as I am, and yet your opposite number feels exactly that same way too. Absolutely. Did I tell you I played the devil in the <laughs> titular? I saw the devil. Yeah, this guy is the devil, for sure. Well, I'm going to bring us out of the darkness a little bit here with my number seven, and that is Winnie the Pooh from 1969, or Winnie Pooh, a Soviet adaptation of the first chapter of the A.A. A. Milne stories, and it was directed by Fyodor Kitruk and voiced by Vladimir Osinev, Evgeny Leonov, and Ia Savina. In this installment, Pooh prevails upon Piglet to help him raid the upper reaches of a tree in pursuit of honey. This was easily the most pure fun I had watching anything on my list this year. I was always fond of the American Winnie the Pooh, but I relate to this one I have discovered a lot more. I wish I could have seen this as a kid. Yeah, you would have become that Pooh if you had seen that as a kid. <laughs> the American Winnie the Pooh is a little more put upon and self-deprecating with his trademark exasperation and oh bother. He's kind of Charlie Brownish, where the Soviet Winnie the Pooh is more punk rock and rough around the edges. And that's both with his behavior 
and the literal animation itself. I love how often he breaks the fourth wall and will just pause to stare at the viewer like, are you seeing this too? Or to appeal for advice or to just talk through his thought process with you as you are watching him. But the best part is how much it really captures the spirit of kids just going about their playful business. There's a great bit of kids logic where Pooh wallows around in a puddle until he's filthy so that the bees will think he's just a rain cloud floating from a sky blue balloon and pay him no mind. The thing I think I like the best of all of that part, though, is him doing something that I know I did at this age when I was in my own little world. To pass the time, he just tromps around the countryside singing songs that he is making up on the spot and singing them in his rough little voice. It is such great fun. I'm also going to pull in Erica and squeeze in recommendations for the sequels. Winnie the Pooh pays a visit in 1971 and Winnie the Pooh and a busy day in 1972. They're super short, so they're easy to all watch together. I'll allow it. How about your number eight? I've got a little respite here from the darkness. This is fun. This to me was the real grab your popcorn and settle in kind of a movie. And that was Ega from 2012. Not to be confused with Ega with Arch Hulls Jr. and Sr. Lampoon by MST3K. This was directed by S.S. Rajamuli and J.V.V. Satya Rayana. It's about a murdered man who is reincarnated as a housefly and seeks to avenge his death. And it stars Sudeep Nani and Samantha Ruth Prabhu. I had so much fun watching this. We just could not believe the twists and turns in this one. It just goes balls out in terms of revenge as well, which is really great. Also great is that the villain is really the standout here because the hero is dispatched pretty quickly. And then when he becomes the avengeful fly and you see him write, I will kill you <laughs> after engineering a near fatal car accident. This is a thing of laugh out loud, hilarity and joy. Yeah, it's so visually inventive. And it's probably been a long time since I've laughed this hard about a homicidal quest. So how about your next choice? Well, this is the exact opposite of the popcorn movie. My number eight choice is Solstice from 1971, directed by Walter Ungerer. And this may be the one choice on my list that's going to be more difficult for people to get into. It's probably the least accessible compared to all the others. Walter Ungerer is probably best known for his experimental short films, and this definitely falls under that category. This is part three of a five-part sequence about a place called Ubiland, which is a strange and magical place that exists both as abstract idea and physical realm. The first part is mainly sound with a succession of fleeting avant-garde images. It has no real specific setting or traditional narrative. The second installment, it takes place in a television studio. It's specifically emphasizing the artificiality of everything. But the reason this one really hit me and appealed so much to me is that it represents the actual physical geography, the landscape of Ubiland, which is mainly a serene forest in the winter. There's this eerie sense of purpose to these figures that traverse this landscape in these odd, almost cultish processionals. In those sections, I enjoy how much it takes me out of my own time and it allows my imagination to entertain this idea of this being anything from today to centuries ago. It loses its effectiveness a little bit for me when some of the characters actually speak, though. It definitely has an air of arty pretense or student film self-consciousness when some of these folks ramble on too long. If you can make it through that, though, the non-dialogue parts of this are incredibly evocative and compelling. It's my favorite film of the sequence, and if it had been nothing but these non-dialogue sections, which are kind of an impressionistic cross between Over the Garden Wall and Two Years at Sea, I would want to live in this forever. Might I suggest that you watch it with the sound off at some point? This one wouldn't work for me that way, I don't think, because the marginal sounds that you hear the tap of a walking stick or the creak of a lantern or this odd music that they play as part of this final parade, I wouldn't want to miss that. This wouldn't be the same that way. 
Got it. I thought maybe you were just going to put on one of those eight hour long Victorian ships in the <laughs> harbor with the fog noises and just let that play. Now, my next choice also would not work without sound. You want to get the dialogue here, and that is Clouds of Sils Maria from 2014, written and directed by Olivia Sayas with Juliette Binoche, Kristen Stewart, and Chloe Grace Moretz. Juliette Binoche plays a film star who comes face to face with an uncomfortable reflection of herself while she's starring in a revival of the play that launched her career. She started as the ingenue, she's now playing the older woman's part. Juliette Binoche is just simply unforgettable. Kristen Stewart equally matches her, and then Chloe Grace Moretz takes it all home. These women just knock the story out of the park. We've got the snake in the atmosphere, the snake in the grass, your own coiled snake of jealousy and doubt and regret and ego. And we've got sort of the play within the play, though it's not that pat. It's very compelling. And once we get to the end, we can feel the years that have passed from that ingenue to forgotten woman and how it will repeat again by the time we get to Chloe Grace Moretz 20 years from now. Now, I don't think you were ever a big fan of the Twilight franchise, but based on the things I'm watching I've never watching seen you, any of them. Oh, really? Yeah. Based on the things I've been watching you watch lately, are you becoming, as the kids say, a case to stan? Ooh, what does, does that mean I like Kristen Stewart? Is yes. that what that breaks down to? Yes. <laughs> you know, I've been avoiding her a lot, but I really liked her in this. I loved her in Adventureland as well, so I think she knows what she's doing. I just don't need ligers thrown in at the same time. <laughs> okay, we're starting to get near to the end. What have you got for us? In the number nine slot, I have Sindbad from 1971. This is a Hungarian film directed by Zoltan Husarek and starring Hungarian acting legends Zoltan Latinovic, Margit Dajka, and Eva Rutkai. A lot of Zoltans running around here. These names may not mean a lot to listeners that aren't super familiar with Hungarian film, but between the three of them, well, actually four of them if you throw in the director, their credits and reputations are massive in Hungary across stage, screen, even poetry recitation. So this is a film with a serious pedigree. Even with that, though, we know that that sometimes doesn't add up to success because of ego, weak material, the stars just not metaphorically aligning, etc., but not this. This is the most perfect first time watch I saw all year. It stands above all the rest as my favorite discovery, though my next film in the number 10 slot is a close second. It's about a privileged aristocrat nearing the end of his life, and he's recalling his past loves and the hearts he has broken, confessing that he was a self loathing hedonist. This is such a specific wavelength that this operates on. It affects me so much because this central question of what is there but these wonderful, powerful, yet fleeting sensations is something I find myself thinking all the time, especially as I age. And I don't mean that in the sense of woe is me, life is slipping away, but in a more pragmatic way of I don't believe anything comes after this, so why not? Right. Take the self-loathing part out and put the self-loving part Back in. Uh, I don't know. I kind of relate to the self-loathing part, too, <laughs> okay. if we're being honest here. And if all of that sounds indulgent, it's supposed to. The spirit of this film is all about indulgence and the costs associated with that and whether or not there is any true reckoning for those things or, in fact, for anything at all. It's empirically beautiful to look at, but even more so, it evokes this feeling in me of a deeper beauty that cannot be held. If you try to, it will just dissolve right in your hands, just as your memory of it eventually will also. I could just go on forever about this because it is stunning and it spoke to me like nothing else this year, but I won't because this is going to get the full episode treatment from us eventually. Okay, so what do you have in your anchor spot? I picked... Mandy from 2018, way back when 2018 seemed like but a distant memory of joy and beauty, all of us frolicking in the woods. <laughs> this was directed by Panos Kosmatos, also co-written by him, with Nick Cage, Andrea Riseborough, and Linus Roach. I had been waiting to see this one. I needed to be 
in the right frame of mind, it needed to be the right time of day, and I chose wisely, which was twilight by myself. This did not disappoint. It is about a couple deeply in love, living a fairly enchanted life in this secluded forest. But that dream is brutally shattered by this hippie cult and their demon biker henchmen, and it sends Nick Cage off into a spiraling, surreal rampage of vengeance. A lot of revenge on your list. You're trying to get yep. even with a lot of things here. Yep, and I'm not done yet. <laughs> <laughs> now, when we say that their lives are enchanted, it's very true. And at the same time, we're in this very real 80s feeling. Imagine you're living in your dream Colorado cabin, rumpus room, den of love, and then this very real but supernatural cult comes so I've also at the same time been watching all of this stuff about Nexium, the sex cult and that shitbag Keith Raniere. So when I say that this is all quite surreal and yet somehow grounded, it's true when you watch this, when you get that perspective. All totally embodied here in Linus Roach being completely insane and yet very real with his horrible followers, still in that real but odd 80s cult vibe. And what's the worst or the best is that Mandy's death is the most grounded, real moment. And that makes it more horrific because it is truly terrible. I think one of my favorite moments is Bill Duke saying, just tell me, which you will understand when you see it. And I would watch this again, which I think is saying something. Okay, I'm going to bring us back from the abyss. Thank you. <laughs> With, my number With the 10. abyss? <laughs> no. Dang it. My choice for number 10 is The Man Who Planted Trees from 1987. This is a Canadian animated short directed by Frederick Back and based on Jean Giono's short story of the same name. Oddly enough, Philippe Noiret makes his second appearance on our list here because he narrates the French language version of this. But the one that we watched was the English language version narrated beautifully by Christopher Plummer. It is the story of a shepherd's long and successful effort to single-handedly reforest a desolate valley in the Alps and Provence throughout the first half of the 20th century. This movie is just glorious. There is so much in it that makes me feel genuinely good and peaceful and hopeful. The quiet and no need to fill that quiet, his unceasing and thoughtful work, a good dog being all the company you need. I love the idea of how historical events are so crucial and yet in some places can have no immediate observable impact at all. Most important though is the sense that you get of unwavering faith, remaining true to your vision and the overwhelming positivity that can come from that. And the film isn't sanitized. It doesn't shy away from the horrors of war or our darker impulses and how a community can suffer because of that. But by the end, all of that is washed away to the point that you don't even remember it through his devotion and toil. I didn't set it up this way on purpose, but I am so glad that coincidentally this is coming at the end of my chronological list. I'm so glad to end on this message that is emphasizing the positive impact that one determined and dedicated person can have. It's the only one on my list that I actually made a point to make sure that you saw because it's just such a wonderful thing to share, I feel like. It's a reminder of hope and the value of gentle persistence and perseverance. It's something that a lot of us can use right now. I know I can. I agree and thank you, because reflecting back on my list, it's a whole lot of one-person vision to the evil of humanity, to persistence being a terrible thing in their respects. Well, speaking of that, did you have any other patterns that emerged in your choices or other things that you found noteworthy this time around? I think there was quite a bit of seeing actors that I knew, for example, Monty Woolley, in a totally different light, and then discovering some people that were totally new to me, like Gracie Fields, for example. But getting to see Flora Robeson with all of the years of her experience really shine, and then Nick Cage doing something that really only he can do is pretty spectacular. Well, mine, I think, is more about the disposition of my list. I had one more American choice than last year for a total of three, 
one silent, one noir, and one experimental short. And I feel like I had more of a fun geographical spread this time. North America had better representation overall with the addition of a Mexican and a Canadian title. I also didn't have as large a chronological gap this time as opposed to last year. Only the 40s got left out of my list, basically. Otherwise, I had entries from the 20s through the 80s. But generally, I feel like this was a year of opposite poles. On the positive side, I am overall much more pleased with how my year of viewing turned out versus last year in at least one regard. No film-based New Year's resolutions meant I was more free to follow my viewing whims wherever they may lead, so I feel generally much happier with what this list reflects and how I sort of roamed all over the place. And when I think back on how I felt while I was watching these, I think more fondly of the experience in total this year. The only resolution that I'm making this year that's even tangentially film-related is that I'm going to save up and get a print from John Lurie. I love the art that he is making these days, and it would be great to have something to look at every day from one of my favorite creators across a number of media. And he's got a show coming as well. Yeah, on HBO Max, Painting with John. So if you are a fan of Fishing with John, like I am a devoted fan, it's probably going to be pretty fun. I think what also emerged as we're talking about this is the surprises that came to me from titles I had never heard of from these houses that you like to buy from, these labels, these specialized labels like Mondo, like Vinegar Syndrome, like Arrow. So I just took it on faith and gave it a whirl and had such a good time. And as you already mentioned, yeah, there was a whole lot of revenge, a lot of darker stuff here. And I didn't watch as many of your choices. You watched most of mine, but we just had totally different schedules this year. So we didn't watch as much together. Yeah, that's one of the tally marks on my less positive side of things list. I think we would be remiss if we didn't talk about the struggles of this unprecedented year. And the most obvious way that it affected our list is that for the first time, we didn't have any shared favorites in our top 10. I think not going to the theater contributed a lot to that because we often found those that way through trips to Austin Film Society, things like that, but we just didn't have any this time. And the biggest thing, I feel like my attention span is garbage right now, essentially. I think a lot of people listening can probably relate. I've gotten into this pattern of nearly obsessively checking the news. I have to make a concentrated effort to put my phone out of the room so that I am not looking at it if I want to truly watch something and pay attention. And the general mood that that created often affected what I chose to watch, not even starting some things because of how I generally felt every day. That's never happened to me before, and I don't know that it will be permanent. I don't think so. I'm not a big believer in not being able to rebound if I put my mind to it. I feel like the year ahead obviously could provide some relief. I look forward to not feeling like I have to check Twitter every five minutes to keep up with potential catastrophes. So I think I can overcome these bad habits I've developed and turn this back towards something more productive and fun. That's my big goal. Not a resolution necessarily, but that is what I would like to focus on in the year ahead. I resolve to not have three honorable mentions like I do this year, but 25 <laughs> next year. How about that? That's great. I'm actually stealing a page out of your book in terms of turning things toward more fun. And I've got more honorable mentions than you have. Whoa. Well... I've got length, though, maybe, because I chose I, Claudius, so that was a big-time investment. Also, The Orchard End Murder and a Muck with an exclamation point. Coming in in that second 10 for me, I had a really fun French crime film called The Sleeping Car Murders from 1965. More Soviet animation with their version of The Little Mermaid from 1968, which is just beautiful. Yuri Menzel's Capricious Summer from 1968, which feels like a prototype or a satellite version of Sinbad, my favorite film on the list here. I finally got to see William Greaves' excellent experimental provocations of symbiopsychotaxoplasm from 1968 also, so I had three from 68 right there in a row. I also put Amok on my list because of the eternal Barbara Boucher, and then moving it into more contemporary times, I have Mount Head from 2002, which is an incredible animated short from Japan. I had a ton of animation, it turns out. And then finally, The Haunted Swordsman from 2019, which is the latest entry from puppeteer Kevin McTurk and his collaborators at the Spirit Cabinet. Just amazing. It is so cool. And I think you just got the chance to buy it as well, right? 
yeah, that one will be added to the collection here in the next week or two as soon as it shows up. And that brings us to the end of 2020 and episode 148. First and foremost, right here, we would like to say a special thanks to Gary Tronrud for becoming our newest Patreon supporter. We appreciate that very much. If what we do here is valuable to you and you would like to support that, we would certainly love for you to check out our Patreon at patreon.com slash magic lantern. The $5 a month level gets you access to a big backlog of bonus episodes, and those come out on the Mondays alternating with regular episodes, so you never have to go a week without new Magic Lantern in your life. If you would just like to get in touch with us, you can reach us via email at magiclanternpodcast at gmail.com. We are on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. Just search for Magic Lantern Podcast on any of those platforms. We are on Twitter, at lantern underscore cast. And this is where I usually do our regular shout outs. But since this is our end of the year show, I just wanted to say thanks to everyone. Thank you if you are listening right now. Thank you for listening throughout the year. Thank you if you've shared our links, retweeted us, or just told someone about the show. We truly appreciate all of that because word of mouth is how we grow. We don't spend anything to advertise the show. So if you are helping by sharing the show or talking about us, please make sure to tag us so we can acknowledge you and say thanks. We are on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Stitcher Radio, Spotify, just about anywhere you get your podcast, you can find us. If you'd like to leave us a rating or review via any of those services, we would certainly appreciate that. And finally, you can find all of our episodes, including supplemental material, at the website magiclanternpodcast.com. Well, honey, thanks for getting through 2020 with me. Yeah, it wasn't easy sometimes. It's true. And thank you for everyone who listened this year. Thank you. Have a wonderful, wonderful end of the year and better 2021. And thank you for listening to the Magic Lantern Podcast. 